We want the truth, so watch Truth Wanted live Fridays at 7 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash yttw and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call tw. everybody it is december 19th 2021 i think i don't even know where i am anymore i am coming to you live from beautiful apologia studios here in glorious nova scotia because my computer exploded 10 minutes before the pre-show but our fabulous crew and paul helped make this happen so hello everybody and who's with me today you might ask arden Oh Arden my is with god, me. I can't believe they let me onto this show again. <laughs> oh, I insisted. <laughs> I'm Aww. so excited. I am so excited to have you here today. Uh, and we are very excited to take your calls. The number is down below. You can also go into the website and we will take your calls. We will prioritize these callers as always. And we want to hear what your reasons are for believing and why you think we should believe too. So without any further ado, Arden, Arden, Arden's taking the wheel today. Arden's in charge. So if anybody doesn't like the callers, don't come to me. Don't come to me. That's right. Give, give me the <laughs> shit. Uh, all right. Let's bring in Ray. Pronouns are ambiguous. Okay. Not sure what that means yet, but we'll maybe find out. You awesome. are live. All right. Ray. Hello. Ray, can you hear us? Oh. Ray. All right, why don't we pop right back in the queue because all right something's going on there uh right. let's try uh how about we go for arnie and washington pronouns are he him awesome you're alive what's up can you hear us arnie uh-oh can no callers hear us womp, womp, womp. <laughs> that would be up. right in line with how everything has been going with that for us thus far today well we'll get the crew to help with that <laughs> Arnie, can you hear us? Arnie, can you hear us? All right, I'm going to return Arnie back to the queue. All right. <laughs> we, we will get the we will get the crew to have a look and see what's going on. So Arden, why don't you tell me what's going on in your world while we're waiting for them to sort out the calls? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I do my transatlantic call-in show on Saturdays over on the Line Network, and that's been going swimmingly. We're about to dive into our season two at the start of the new year, which is so exciting. So nice. much new stuff planned. It's going to be such a cool show. Uh, I'm really excited. And I love how much uh, support we've gotten from like uh, all the people here. Every time I've shown up here, I get a slew of new people over there who are so excited to like learn about trans issues and are really understanding. Um, so that's awesome. Uh, yeah, it's been so cool to be a part of like this community and learning how to do these calls and, and host a show and all that awesome stuff. But yeah, how about you? How have you been? It's been so long since we've gotten to be together on something. I know. I know. The last, I think, was nonprofits. Yep. Like, a long time ago. We, yeah. And I don't know that we've done a call-in together at all, so I have been hyped up about it all day. And then, of course, the tech issue gnomes decided that they were going to try to thwart us, but we're not going to let that happen. They're rebooting the lines <laughs> right now, so... You can't thwart us, tech issue gnomes. We're going to take calls, Arden and I. So I have been we are so gonna get hyped. There. <laughs> we are going to get there. We're going to try again in a few moments. Crew, let us know in the group in the chat on the side when we're able to take another one because I'm hyped to do it and we want to talk to everybody. Um, so please keep trying to call through. We will get we will get to you. Don't panic. Everything is under control. Grab your towel. Everything is fine. I have been up to not a whole lot lately, actually, just getting ready for Christmas. Over on my channel in Shannon Q, I actually just had a conversation with Dr. Joel Baden uh, about who wrote the Pentateuch. That was really, really interesting. So if anybody's interested in who wrote the Pentateuch, he's a uh, Pentateuch, can't pronounce it evidently. He is a professor at Yale Divinity School who teaches Old Testament and he was a delight to talk to. Oh, right. that's so interesting. 
<laughs> Perfect. All right. Let's see if we can take another call through. Yeah. We're going to give it a try. We're going to give we, it a try. Why don't we, since it seems like it's call in studio, not the callers, which should we try Wraith again, maybe bring our, <laughs> that first caller back in? Let's Wraith, give another try. Can you hear us? Can we hear you more importantly? Wraith, hello. Well, <laughs> all right. We'll return you to the queue. If you are in the queue, please stay in the queue while we are working on getting the lines fixed. Well, perfect. How's uh, how's everyone in the chat doing? Hopefully, you're all uh, ready to, to to watch us try to tag team some callers and <laughs> not sit here and <laughs> and banter with one another. Though we could, we could fill we could fill probably an hour and a half. You and I just bantering about stuff. I think. Probably. I'm sure if we got, got on some brain topics, we could both go back and forth forever. All right. Oh. We've gotten the okay to try again. So let's, okay. let's, uh, let's try Master one fingers. more time. Everybody, everybody say a prayer. Right in New York, <laughs> please. Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear yes! you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, You're the most, okay. the most excited we've ever been to take a call, right? <laughs> Welcome to the wow. experience. And, man, the most excited... Hold on, I want to I want to ruminate on that for a second. The most okay. excited you've ever been to take a call. Yep. Why? Well, because we couldn't take any calls. <laughs> oh, okay. So now you've got, you have a huge yeah. expectation to live up to. You're saving us from uncomfortable <laughs> dead air. I, I can't let everyone down. Wow. All right. Okay. What would you like so to I wanted to talk about I wanted to talk about um I ascribe to more than one world religion, yet I seem to be in a, I put myself in a state of mental cognitive dissonance where I can almost put my, I can, you know, uh, become an atheist or an agnostic or a total believer in more than one polytheistic, monotheistic, amalgamistic religious sort of kind of belief structure. And I'd like to talk about also Luciferian Satanism, and if you guys thought it was a good, you know, uh, religion as far as uh, offering any sense of good ethical moral structure. Well, let's take one item at a time. So let's pick let's pick one topic for the call. So let's go with what what I think is the most interesting is. Okay, what do you that, think is the most interesting, Shannon Q? Did you say that you subscribe to multiple theistic views simultaneously? Is that what you're saying? But you have for the most about part, it? yes, yes, yeah. So, so do you believe the the tenets of each of those individual faiths? It, faiths is true simultaneously. So, like, if you subscribe to, to Taoism certain, to and a, to, Hinduism and yeah. some form of monotheism, you would think that those all are correct and non-contradictory. To a certain degree, if you add in the corp, the corp, the one of the, if you add in uh, what I like to call the fragmentation theory of religion, theoretic of, of the text, if you if you know and go into with the assumption that the text that you're already reading since they're so old and come from copies upon copies of manuscripts, that those texts are probably fragments of the whole truth that they were believing back in those times anyway. When the well, why would you ascribe a, founded, a so truth there's... value? How how do you get to a truth value, would... though? Well, I mean, kind of like, it's very easy, like, when you mention the Tao, I mean, the Tao is not necessarily a religion, more of a set of beliefs, you know, right. and when you say you can't understand suffering without joy, I think that's pretty evident as truth, don't you, wouldn't you say, or would you disagree? Uh, well, I think that that's actually inconsequential, because the question... The question that I'm trying to get at is how do you, you're saying that you believe in all of these simultaneously because even though they have contradictions and each point to a different deity. And the reason mm -hmm. that you do that is because you think that they must have known some version of truth, but that it was corrupted along the way. But that in and of itself is a claim to truth. So you're ascribing it a truth value without any evidence aside from you just making this sort of intuitive assertion that you, th you think it seems like it must be truth. So how do you determine what is or isn't true? Okay, well, I hear and understand what you're saying. Um, but, you know, when 
we're understanding that for the most part, religions are claiming supernatural realities right. to be true, not necessarily uh-huh. scientific realities. And okay. since even though those supernatural claims can tend to make claims on the scientific world on, that we live in and the, uh, the natural world that we live in, however, when those religions are mostly making claims about the afterlife and what we do in this life and how we get to the afterlife, Mm -hmm. those things offer us a good reason to believe and why we should believe based on the hope, you know? So it's not necessarily a matter of truth. It's a matter of what we believe, why, and so it's not truth. You know what I mean? I I think I, I think I I don't see that. I see it as a misnomer. You see, well, you you said that you believe that there's a degree of truth in it, but now you're saying that it doesn't matter if it is or isn't true because it's about reward and consequence. So you, Pascal, wagered your way kind of away from a- actively saying, well, I believe it's true and I can demonstrate that it's true to, well, I would like it to be true because there's a reward involved if it is true. So best I act as though it's true in order to garner that reward. Not necessarily act as though I were, it were true, but believe, believe true. and hope, if you can, as though it were true. Because I think, you know, I've been struggling with for a long time now the idea of my own immortality and trying to put death and the state of death into words. Okay. And I think that, you know, find if you believe that, more, that the state of death is being in a state where you will you where you will not know that you are not, and all. Okay. But right the moment before you die, you will know that you are about to be in that state. In the moment before you die, you can know that all re- space, time, and matter will exist beyond that point in time. That's and just so, an assertion, though. That's a, that's just an assertion. You're just you're you're saying intuitively I would like this to be true. So I'm positing that if that this would be the case if it were true. So that's just a, an assertion based on desires and intuitions. Arden, what do you think? Well, I, I just uh, you're you're saying like you hope for all this stuff, and I, I totally understand wrestling with like this kind of fear of what you know the state of being dead is like, the state of not existing. Like that's hard to even wrap your head around. Uh, cause you don't experience yeah. it and you're trying to contextualize it in the sense of an experience. Uh, but I, I don't really understand what, what, why this notion of some sort of afterlife would give you hope. Like for me, I get hope from like, a a, a realistic or a demonstrable alleviation to my anxieties and suffering. And if something isn't demonstrable, like I, it could be the case that, you know, my family's going to get a billion dollars when I die, but I'm not, that's not going to bring me hope or comfort because there's, I don't see any reason to believe that, you know? So why would that bring you hope if you don't mm-hmm. have, like, what evidence do well, you I have of that I've that would bring you hope? Good question. I have to say I'm a little bit silver samurai about it, X-Men Origins Wolverine about it, that an eternal life is the eternal, eternal life is, uh, an eternal life is the only life that can have true meaning. And he was willing to kill someone. And oh, I hate that idea. I hate that. Yeah, I, I that's think... absolutely terrible. Why? Why would the only life that matters be one that's eternal? Like humans have lived for tens and hundreds of thousands of years. They've lived and died to get us to the point today where we, you know, have like medicine to address issues. Why do those lives not matter because they weren't eternal? Or I guess you're asserting that they are you're eternal, just, but I, just... I don't see evidence of that. So. You're... You're just a grain of sand in a caused, causeless universe. So, that okay. Sand doesn't did, matter. So, it does matter. A grain in of sand doesn't years, have a. Okay, one, no how, sh- one second, please, please, because I, I think this is very, much, very important to address. And it's something that uh, I have a bit of disdain for hearing, really, because mm-hmm. you're saying essentially, unless something exists forever, it has no value. So there's no contextualized value. And a grain of sand doesn't have a sense of self, right? So I have value because I have experiences. And those experiences are valuable to me. And that's all that is necessary for me to value my own life. And you don't get to tell me that I'm not valuable just because I believe that I'm not eternal. 
You don't get to tell me that the sense of value that I feel towards myself and everybody else isn't real. You you just don't well, get Shannon, to say that. And you don't, you know what? Believing that I'm a meaningless, nothing grain of sand. Why do you believe that you're meaningless? No heirs, because rarity is no value. Heirs, and I get told that on a constant daily basis. The fact that I get abused on a constant daily basis in my life is nothing been but, but a, a series of victimizations of sexual assault when I was in my early childhood, by, even by my own father, you know, and have to sit here and believe in a God of love who can turn mashed potatoes, who can turn mountains into mashed potatoes and rivers and streams and the soda pop if he wanted to, but chooses not to in the indifference and the suffering of all the starving children and people of the world. Wraith, Wraith, I hear and respect um, that you were willing to share that with us. And I hope that you s find value in yourself without needing to contextualize it for eternity, because it sounds like that's something that would be important for you to live a better version of the life that you have now and would be more beneficial than seeking to, to find value after this is over. So... We, I, I sense that this is going to an emotional place for you and that broadcasting those emotions on a public forum is not necessarily something that would be beneficial um, for you. So I, we are going to let you and go. Why not? Are I going give you to... full permission. Why not? I, I give you full permission. So I, I speak in a, a passionate vernacular. Right, right, is, it not, right. is it wrong to I, speak in the common right. tongue? No, it's not. It's, this, isn't about this isn't about you giving consent. This is about you bringing up something that's an incredibly emotional experience. And this is something that many, many people will view. And you don't necessarily understand the impact of that at, in this moment. And we appreciate speaking to you. But I am going to let you go so that you can just kind of ruminate on the conversation. And, and I'm hoping that you will utilize some resources that are available, things like freedom from religion or other therapeutic avenues, so that you can get professionals to to help you contextualize these things that happen so that you can have a better current existence okay all right thank you Wraith. all right oh awesome oh that's heartbreaking all right before we take yeah. another call we do uh hate to interject with this after something like that if you got if you are somebody who is feeling that way we do want to talk to you uh however i i would ask you to please seek professional assistance as well. We are not therapists or counselors, nor are we qualified to, to have these conversations. And they are not always the best conversations to have in a public forum because you don't necessarily realize the impacts to yourself um, afterwards. So mm -hmm. before we go on, I will say that if you do like what we do here and you would like to support us, you can become a member for as little as 99 cents a month. Last time I did this, I said dollars. It's not. It's 99 cents a month. You just click the join button. Although if you want to give $99 a month, I'm sure they'll <laughs> You can click the join button down below the video and that'll give you access to special chat emojis and things like that. So that and you won't have and you'll be able to bypass the slow mode in the chat so you won't have you won't have to wait two minutes to send your messages so if you have lots of important things to say and you want to get them out that's the way to do it you can just pay 99 cents uh and make sure that you check out all of our other shows as well we have secular sexuality on thursday starting at 7 p.m central <laughs> i love secular sexuality um and we also have truth wanted live on fridays at 7 p.m and then there are the sunday shows talk heathen at 1 p.m central followed by the nonprofits, which is on right before the atheist experience, the show you're watching now at 3 p.m. Central, or you can support us on Patreon. All right, Arden, you ready to take another call? Yeah. You got the real, you got the wheel. Let, let, let's uh, take Arnie, who we tried to take earlier, bring him yes. in. Uh, Arnie, he, him in Washington, what's going on? Oh, I'm a little pissed at myself because I, if oh. Shannon, if I'd known that you were going to be on today, I've been saving a brain question, but I know you guys don't like to switch subjects, so I can stick to my original Next call. If I'll be back. I promise I'll be back. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, this is regarding Mormonism and sort of how it's referred to on the show typically. I know it's every host is a little different, but um, I'm in kind of a weird place. I'm an ex-Mormon, and yet... Mm -hmm. When Mormonism is sort of uh, used as the go-to ridiculous example of, of a religion, it still mm -hmm. kind of like gets under my skin. And I, 
I don't know why. I mean, I'm not, I don't have a vested interest in it anymore. I mean, I still have family that are members, but um, mm-hmm. I'm more curious, why is it that that sort of, like, what is it about Mormonism that makes it stand out as, as that kind of an example? Uh, I could give you uh, a reason why I would utilize it and in the context I would that might help kind of elucidate it. Um, so in the, when I am or other hosts are, I, can't, I, I suppose I should only speak for myself, but when I utilize it, it's usually in the context of having a conversation with a Christian. Um, and in that conversation with a Christian, they would absolutely reject um, a lot of the claims of the Mormon faith and see them as outright ridiculous, even though it's analogous to and is kind of like an addendum to their faith. So utilizing the out, the outsider test of faith and then using Mormonism, Mormonism as the example allows somebody who has a similar or almost parallel belief set to recognize that in that even though those belief sets are parallel and have some overlap, there are claims within that belief set that they would have to like sort of on their face admit are ridiculous in the hopes that that will kind of bring them to the point that they think to themselves, oh, okay, well, I'm I'm just outright dismissing this is ridiculous. However, there are similar things within my faith, which is the point of utilizing the example to say, hey, there's ridiculous stuff here too. But it brings it into stark contrast that because it's because it's so close and in, in, in parallel. And also there's a lot more contemporary history supporting the Mormon faith that you can, because, because it was so much, so recently created that you can say, okay, well, if you're saying there's historical documentation that backs up your faith, Mormons can say that as well. And in fact, have archives and archives and archives full of historical documentation that far surpasses potentially what you would be referencing. So why wouldn't you believe that instead? So it, it's got a lot of interesting sort of allegories and parallels that allow that to come to stark contrast uh, in these types of conversations. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's more like an issue with me. I'm sure, like in a few years, it probably won't even bother me. But since I'm kind of a recent ex-Mormon, you're, um, you're deconstructing, so yeah, you it, have lots of latent uh, faith-related, probably like cognitive I- infrastructure that that's related to that previous faith that you maybe don't even realize yet. I, I still have like latent Christianity all over me, <laughs> mm, mm. And, and it it pops its ugly head up in the strangest situations and I have to kind of deconstruct in those moments and think, okay, is this something that's a vestige that I just didn't even realize was the case? So how long would it take for you to not be defensive? Uh, I don't know if I know the answer to that question. To not be defensive. (laughs) I don't know if I know the answer because I think that in certain instances I could still be defensive and that may have a root in the fact that I did wholeheartedly believe it. And I don't like to think that I'm silly. So there must, there must have been a good reason in my mind for me to believe it and saying it's ridiculous is kind of akin to saying I'm ridiculous and believe and was incapable of believing foolish things. And Mm. that's, that's an emotional tie. I don't know. What do you think, Arden? You defensive? (laughs) <laughs> I, I mean, I think, I, I don't know if I've ever used it in myself, but I think most of the, I, I can see its utility as like an allegory, especially because like, you know, when you're dealing with, with Christians, for example, maybe it's it's not as easy to directly like disprove Jesus or something, right? The existence of Jesus, like it, there's like an argument that can be had there, but with some of the claims of like the Mormon faith, I think it's a little bit more easy to like directly disprove claims that they make oftentimes. So it's a little bit easier to show how ridiculous it is and or certain things of it are or certain aspects of it are and that people still believe it um so yeah i think i think it can be used as a really powerful allegory because it's like the same phenomenon going on right but just kind of blown up to like a, a larger proportion of like um the the suspension of disbelief that you have to engage in to like actually think that those things are true uh but yeah, I mean, I can understand how that would be frustrating, and it's maybe not always helpful in getting Mormons to think that a uh, uh, atheism is like a a warm, friendly place to go. But you know, uh, it's kind of hard when you're working with this like sort of activist stuff, and you have to take sort of a utilitarian calculus. Like, is this example going to be useful in communicating my point in this conversation, or is it going to like off put certain groups of people to a certain degree? And I think everyone comes to like a different conclusion on those sort of calculus. So 
I, I don't know uh, I if there was out, like a can I good answer. Out downside. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, no, no, go ahead. I'd like to point out a downside. <laughs> so uh, one thing about Mormonism is to understand it, it does take a, a huge investment of like time and effort. And so most people aren't going to make that time and effort investment. The only way typically people who really know Mormonism deeply are the people that used to be Mormon. And so when someone um, refers to Mormonism as being ridiculous and then points out maybe some thing that appears on the surface to be ridiculous, Mormons hearing that say, well, obviously that person doesn't know my religion, and it sort of galvanizes them and reaffirms them. And I know it's not your mission to, like, you know, deconvert Mormons in general, but that's just one downside is that um, it referring to it as ridiculous makes Mormons like, you know, double down like, oh, yeah, now I know it's true because we're being persecuted. Yeah, I, I totally hear that. And I mean, this is something I, I deal with all the time. Like for me, I, I love empiricism, right? I have a show on trans rights and I like to argue trans rights from empiricism. But there are some people who feel like that ostracizes certain people and will never move certain people over to caring about the rights of like a marginalized class of people. Uh, and so like that, that I understand why that's frustrating. I absolutely think it's possible that it could make someone like completely shut down any consideration they would have of like deconstructing their faith but at the same time you can't be responsible for every individual's deconstruction and like like i said for me there's a utilitarian calculus that takes place i said like i would think in this moment i don't think i'm going to put off as many people as they may be convincing and so i think it's acceptable to use this example here uh but yeah like certainly if you're at like a, a way the time. i get it yeah i, I mean and it it, that sucks because right some people are going to be left out by that some people are going to be kind of burned by that and that sucks and that's it's an unfortunate like consequence of communicating ideas uh to broad groups in that way um but i don't really know how it's possible to even avoid that so yeah i don't think there's really one way either i mm -hmm. mean i understand that you're having a you have a visceral reaction to it but other people like the, that's that isn't necessarily the case when it comes to everybody who is a Mormon either. Like some people may hear um, this sort of argument being made and think to themselves, well, now I need to go investigate it and prove that it's it's true. And then come like, and I've heard this story time and time again, so I know it does happen. And through that investigation to prove that it isn't ridiculous, they come to the realization that, oh, shoot, maybe it is. So I think it takes all different manner of communication strategy in order to be able to effectively do like any form of activism. And I, I hear and understand that this one isn't effective or wouldn't have been effective for you and some other people that you may know, but that doesn't mean that it, it's unilaterally not the case that it may be an effective strategy. There would have been a better one for you and the other people that you're speaking about. And I'm sure that it is out there, uh, but that strategy that is effective would have been effective for you may not be effective for for somebody else. So I love I love Arden's uh, phrase of you know the the sort of internal calculus of trying to figure out the best strategy. And the problem is that there is no such thing as one best strategy, because no matter what strategy you land on after you've done those internal deliberations, there's going to be somebody who isn't going to be able to be affected by it. Otherwise, yeah. we'd all, whoever found it would just be able to get us all to believe the, the right things, right? Because because <laughs> they'd be able to effectively communicate to all of us and all of us would be compelled. But there's just so much different, so many different ways that people come to this determinations that it just couldn't be the case, I don't think. Hmm. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, guys. And how do I find out who's on next? Like, is there something online? I, I, I'm not very... Uh tech savvy, but is there a simple website or something I can go to to find out what the host schedule is? I will see if we can take that away because I am not sure of the answer to that, to be perfectly honest with you. Okay. I know that there is a website. The Atheist Experience website is a place that you can go, but I'm not sure if they load the host schedules, but that's a good suggestion. I'll take that away. Mm. So thank you for that. Okay. Arnie. And right. call back and talk to me about brains. <laughs> Thanks, Arnie. I will. I will. I will. Thank you. See you later. Perfect. Thank you, Ernie. All right. All right. Before, before we take the next call, we just wanted to let everybody know that we now have 
pardon me, we now have a channel that houses all of the ACA shows and it's an audio podcast forum and you can visit tiny.cc slash AEN podcast. And there you can go and listen to all of the latest, latest shows from the atheist experience, talk heathen, truth wanted, secular sexuality, nonprofits, and all of the other shows that you see on the Atheist Experience network of channels. We also have three, count them, three Facebook groups that are run by the fans and that you can go interact with and, and you can go interact with people there. The first is the Atheist Experience fan group and you can see it is up on the screen right now. And then there's also the Atheist Experience private fan group and that is where you can go to interact with others and without kind of having to blow your cover so that you can go have these interactions without it being on your public feed. And we also have a new group, the Atheist Experience fan group, Atheist versus Theist Debates. And that is where you can go try some of your arguments or hash out some of the arguments that we've had on the shows here uh, with theists and atheists alike. And you can find that at tiny.cc slash F-B-A-X-P-P-H. <laughs> and you can see it up on the screen as well. So go check them out. Go interact. This is your community. So go make connections. All right, Arden, you ready for another one? All right, let's dive in. Marty. There's a call that I see that is calling my name. So I'm going to bring in Joshua. Pronouns are he, him from North Carolina. Joshua, why don't you tell us what your topic is today? Oh, yes. Um, so I guess I was just curious on, I guess, the abortion. Because I remember, I guess, when I was a theist, I always had thought abortion was wrong for religious reasons. But then when I deconverted, for some reason, abortion, I still kept... I don't know. For some reason, I feel like I'm still against it. Like a part of me thinks like, like we can scientifically verify it's a human life, and we're killing it just because I guess. Or oh no, maybe I was, well, I think well, a part of it it's like it's just convenient, of course, for the female. Then I know a part, like, and I guess that's like the moral argument. And then another part of me is saying like, convenient. like morality and legality are kind of like two different things, and like shouldn't be combined. And I know Matt Dillahunty actually talked about it just a little bit, but I still, I don't know, maybe I don't understand like the fully body autonomy of it. So that's why I was just calling in maybe just for clarification. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I heard a word in there that maybe you don't want to use in your arguments anymore, and that is convenient. <laughs> there is nothing, nothing convenient uh, about having an abortion. It's a, it's a, huge physical risk to um the person carrying the child so you may want to you may want to remove that <laughs> from the argument because i had i had an arnie level physical reaction to that convenient <laughs> is the best word to use um I'll ha i have a position on this that i to me so far for me it seems unassailable and the position is that you do not have the right to utilize any part of my body to sustain anybody's life. None. Nobody's. You cannot, after I give birth to a child, for example, so let's say I give birth to a child and immediately that child needs uh, a piece of my liver or a kidney or a blood transfusion. You cannot force me um, to give any component of my body to sustain that child's life, even after it's born, even when it's an adult, when it's had experiences. So to me, it doesn't follow that you can force me to provide my uterus to sustain the to sustain the life of an embryo um for the same reasons like that's it's my body you do not have the right to tell me that i am going to be forced to give birth and have something reside within my body um for the for the same reasons like it just doesn't it doesn't follow it doesn't make sense to me does that make sense to you? Uh, yes, I difference? guess it makes sense to me, but I guess I would say, like, does it, like, the fetus have rights as well since it, well, well I guess I would have the follow-up question. Rights? Do you guys think, like, the What fetus, rights to my body does it have? What rights to my body does it have? Yeah. What right to my body does it have? What right to my body do you have? What right to your body does anybody have? Is part of the no. rights that that fetus has the right to access my body even if i don't give it permission why does that fetus have rights that you don't have you don't have the right to have any part of my body so why does that fetus get special rights that's correct true 
Right. So that's, that's why to me it seems unassailable. Because when people say a fetus has a right, the right that they're saying that fetus has is not even necessarily the right to life. It's the right to utilize somebody else's body to sustain life. And that's a right that nobody else has walking around on earth right now, living their life, having conversations, eating food, laughing, singing, enjoying existing. They don't have the right to anybody else's body. They're say so when somebody says, doesn't a fetus have rights? They're saying, doesn't a fetus get special rights? And those special rights are that it gets your body, even though, even if you don't want it to. That's what they're talking about, mm. but it's framed differently so that they can make an emotional appeal, which is special pleading because in any other circumstance, you wouldn't say grant those rights, but in this one, for some ever, for some reason, you would. Okay. Yeah. yeah that makes I, I mean, like, even with even with a, a fetus that could survive outside of the womb, like there, there's just there's no reason to to have the rights of that fetus supersede the rights of the woman. Like, I'm sorry, I'm going to pick the the woman who exists currently has life experiences and relationships currently in reality today, right now, over the fetus that has a potential to have all those things in the future. And while sure, you are entitled to your own emotional reaction to that thing that makes you feel weird or icky or whatever, like you can't control your emotions. That's totally fine, but it does not give you the right because it feels icky to you to like, and I'm not saying you're doing this, Joshua, but I think certainly a lot of people do uh, because they have that icky feeling, then go out and advocate that women should not have the right to choose what they want to have happen to their body. Okay. You're here. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> cool. Cool. Yeah, that, that makes sense. sense. I'm just listening. Right on. Well, thank awesome. you for doing that. I appreciate that. I thought, based on the topic, I thought this might be a little bit more combative than it was. So I appreciate you <laughs> being willing to listen. Yeah, no, it was a good conversation. Yeah, because I'm like, I've seen the history of like those like atheist experience debates, but I was just like, because I think it's more important just to listen and hear because maybe I like I came in here and fully didn't understand something. So you guys definitely mm -hmm. made clarify the topic for me so i do appreciate it no cool. this is great we appreciate you thank you yeah, for having the so conversation much, with us <laughs> all right all bye right. joshua yay a productive conversation about abortion and they wow. <laughs> <laughs> i believe in miracles now <laughs> that I see today. <laughs> it can be done it can be done all right cool all right before we take the next call, I just want to let you all know that we have Atheist Experience merchandise that you can get by visiting tiny.cc slash merch ACA. You can get t-shirts and hoodies and coffee mugs and stickers and all kinds of fun stuff there. And there's also a donate now box and donation donations made there in your little chat bar if you're in the live chat right now. Those donations will go to the ACA and we get 100% of the proceeds here at the ACA. You, YouTube does not take a cut because we are a registered nonprofit. So that is the best way that you can support us right now if you are watching live. And if you would like to continue the discussion after the show, join the Atheist Community Discord. It is a fan-run Discord server at tiny.cc slash AC. AC Discord. Sorry, I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. It's very, very tiny on my screen. Finally, we want to send a big thank you out to the crew Woo! Yay! who work very, 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 very diligently through all of the chaos of pre-production and scheduling and all of my tech issues, which are just <laughs> infinite. <laughs> To get you to get us on air today. And also I will be on the Discord after show today. So if yes, you me too. if you want to have a less productive conversation about abortion, we can go do that there. You guys. <laughs> I will be there after the show to have a conversation. All right. Aren't you ready for another one? Let's do it. Yeah, let's bring in Abdullah. He him from New York. Abdullah, what's going on? Hey guys, how's it going? Awesome. Doing well, what's up? Well, my proposition about um, our existence uh, in this world, uh, I mean, you can call the universe at large, um, the proposition for this universe to have a cause, a creator, um, why can't we accept that is probably my confusion. For me, it's because I nobody has demonstrated it. Everyone keeps showing up to talk about these things, keeps saying, why can't you accept it? Why can't you accept it? And it's like I, the same reason I, I don't accept 
Santa or unicorns or leprechauns. Not not I those may be ridiculous comparisons on some level, but it's the same reason. Cause I nobody's shown these things to be actually true. They just keep saying they well, I don't think a lot of people are saying leprechauns are actually true, but I'm sure there's someone out there. So Right. Well, my next question would be, um, what kind of demonstrative um, evidences would you accept? In regards to what? Like, are you talking, which God are you talking about? Like the Christian God? Then which version of the Christian God? Well, which it's the concept of a creator for this creation. That there's a creator, like generically, that there's a creator? And also that right. when you say where well, there's a creator for this creation, that's circular because you're just asserting that it's a creation and therefore requires a creator definitionally. Yeah, um, just like for anything to be come into existence, uh, there has to be a cause. There has to be a reason behind it. Like I'm looking at this beautiful ground here in the field and all these plants are moving. Uh, I definitely don't see the wind, but... The cause behind it is because the wind. But you can uh, demonstrate the wind I mean, is that's there. That's kind of very lame to say. Right, that's right. Right. So uh, for every single thing, there has to be a cause. Now, this universe, as we know, is finite. It has a definitive time period of beginning and end. So um, there and has end? to be a reason behind, a cause behind Oh, yeah. Um, there's there's a is lot of uh, scientific models uh, talking about the total entropy and the heat depth of the universe, um, whatever it sees to exist. So let's get back to the Kalam, though, right? Because that's what you're, you're running the Kalam right now, right? So let's get back to that. So you're saying that anything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, so the universe has a cause, right? So let's get mm -hmm. to yeah. one of the premises. So the universe began to exist. Demonstrate the truth of that premise. Oh, um, so, well, I mean, one of the scientific, well, there is a lot of, uh, there's over 13 different theories. One of them right. that we widely accept is the, the Big Bang, where, you know, right. uh, prior to this cosmic uh, colossal, there was a singular entity uh, or a mass which actually burst into pieces um, to form this whole rapid expansion. Uh, cosmological entities. Okay, so th you're talking about the rapid expansion. So that just demonstrates that a rapid rapid expansion occurred. So demonstrate that nothing happened before that. That it's not cyclical. Demonstrate to me that it's not cyclical. Well, that's exactly the point. The second argument after Kalam is the non-regressive way of uh, our existence. So now we're talking about... Since we exist. So we're talking about theories of time now, right? Even... So now are you talking about theories uh -huh. of time? Like your Hilbert's are telling it? Okay, so that, I, that, that's a premise that I have an issue with because no one's been able to demonstrate to me that, that there's, there's a finite point and that nothing, like truly nothing, existed before that like there was no such thing as existing before that um and that energy isn't the only constant in the universe like to me it seems like energy is potentially the only constant in the universe and it seems as though people just have this desire to have this sort of anthropomorphic insertion of something like a human that is going to be the cause of this like some sort of cognitive entity that has a mental state that made a decision or a determination in order to create for some reason even though it's also self-sustaining right so that which which seems like right. a, a huge uh, disparity to me that people don't often acknowledge. So you're saying that there's like this perfect God who's perfectly happy, he's perfectly self-sustaining. But one day he was like, you know, it would be cool if I just made a bunch of shit. So I'm gonna do that now. And before that, there was right. nothing <laughs> except for this entity who was perfectly whole and self-sustaining and perfectly happy, except he wasn't because he created some stuff. So there's a lot of disparities there for me. Um, that the primary one being that you need to do a lot of like dancing around to say, I absolutely know the origin of the universe. I know that there was definitively nothing no, before I that. Claimed, I know that I absolutely. Claim anything. I that's the second premise of your that. argument. I think in order for... behind uh, the problem I, I see from your understanding is that you're expecting the creator to be a physical being. I'm not expecting it. I'm expecting it to be nothing. Outcome, 
No, not. Where did I say it was no, physical? No, so, <laughs> Where? Like, literally, the, you're, you're telling me I have a problem I don't have because I never said anything about it being physical. So you're just creating a problem and then asserting so that that if, problem if is the accept, one that I have. Right. And it, Okay. If, if you accept the creator to be metaphysical and sure. which can bring things out of it, nothing, which can create things out of nothing, and also the sole cause of everything else. So basically, okay. this creator has to be non-contingent upon anything else mm -hmm. for for it to bring it to existence something sure. so you know okay. you know an islamic perspective what god says is that um are they referring to the creation itself the creators of themselves have what they motivated it to this create? universe the heavens and the earth what motivated so, it yeah what the did it create love of god so God, God didn't have anything to, to love before it created everything? God, God had nothing to love? It needed Absolutely to love something? Absolutely had. Abs okay, so God, why did it create God then? A infinite, right, so God has infinite, uh, God is an infinite creator. So we okay. don't call the creator as creator because it created it. And we know this universe, because in our reality, we understand only this universe. There could be much right. more beyond it. And God could have been, creating for infinite amount of time oh wow. well now you're contradicting your own premise so you're saying that there could have been things before the big bang right so you're contradicting because god could have created he's infinite he could have been creating things for you know infinity so that means that there is well, no the finite point in time which right? actually just that defeats the premise of your own argument if you're utilizing that as a defense of it so and it but still I'm doesn't answer the question why did he create all. because if he's perfectly self-sustaining and he absolutely doesn't require anything he's he's you know all all knowing all powerful omniscient self-sustaining and but then he was motivated somehow to create and he was motivated by love which means now you're attributing him with emotion so he has cognitive states as well so you're giving him a cognitive state and thus he created the entire universe so that he could put one planet around one sun amongst billions to put a bunch of apes on it so that he could have something to love and thus, the let universe me, is created by God. The idea of uh, the misunderstanding about love. Uh, are we conflating? Probably we are conflating in terms of attributes and the exercise of an attribute. Uh, you asked the question that why would God create yeah. something to love it? Uh, yeah. Did God nothing nothing to do before? Did have did he not nothing to love before? I think mm. the the attribute of love and the exercise of the attribute. Is totally two separate things. We're saying God, right, but it would still God be a cognitive is state. eternally loving. Right. right. Yeah. God's in his God's understanding, our creator's understanding, um, he's always loving, he's all loving, just like Al Wadud is the attribute in Arabic. What did he love before he created the universe? Expressing the love. What did he love before he created the universe? Uh, what did he love? Yeah. Before well, he created the so universe, what did he love? That he can think of. So what? What did he so love? Name though? one. Oh, that yeah, he can name one. Of. What did he love? God, God, God is self, self-loving. First thing. So he was God perfectly self-sustaining. So loving. if he loves himself, then but, why would he need to create something to love? That doesn't make sense. Yeah. Well, exactly. I think that there's, there's, there's the gap, right? So this God wasn't enough for God. God needed more than God. <laughs> This is what you're saying. God wasn't enough think, for himself. Uh, you're the prime disappointer. To me, I guess. Uh, no, I, I am listening. I'm sorry. So it's just I don't feel like you're fully answering the questions. Malaika, right? So let me let me just take one minute to just state something yeah, here. Okay, for sure. There are I want some you to other to. beings which is outside the universe that you and me would physically accept, or some people who would outside this dominion of Islam they would not comprehend what is a malaika, what is a jinn. Those are also uh, the, at the the created objects of God, and some mm -hmm. of them pre-exist human beings. Some of them pre-exist the universe itself. Um, so God is eternally asking, uh, you know, talking in a direct way that you know I'm going to create this new creation of human being. And these malaika is asking the question: Are you going to create a creation who will cause much mischief on this earth? Who would mischief here refers to uh, misproportionately place things. So, for example, uh, somebody taking away someone's right, somebody taking away others' property, someone 
feeling or those kind of things are attributed to human beings. So these malaika are asking the question, even before the creation of the universe, they're asking to the God. So no one knows the time period. Our time begins when we know from our creation. So you ask the question, then God simply says, there's so many things that God creates, it's only comprehensible to God. We would probably come to know maybe if God reveals those information. So why do you believe it now, though? And also, like, so it sounds to me like you're saying that there are entities that all that exist on Earth now that maybe we don't understand because we, we have been studied Islam that pre-existed the universe, which means that God created something so that there wasn't a state of nothing then because th these things existed. And if they can interact on Earth here, then that means that they exist within this universe. So they simultaneously exist within this reality and predated this reality and that God created them before the universe. And I don't understand how That's that exactly reinforces. Yeah. yeah. But I don't understand how that reinforces any of the premises of your argument because you're saying there wasn't nothing because he had created things. So nothing wasn't a state that existed. And then he created a universe no, our, also. Our and it still doesn't answer comment. the question of why he created. So can you see why this isn't compelling to, sorry, to, original, to me? Right. Our right? original like, premise is that why can't we accept the fact that, you know, many people, I, I really love and respect the atheists because they are very curious and uh, asking questions. And, you know, one of these scholars, uh, he very beautifully plays it's rather much much better than denying or taking a false object of worship or you know, understanding it to be creator than right. taking none. Uh, and and I, I really commend atheists for that because uh, understanding a human being, you know, some people claim Jesus to be God, uh, which yeah. is a theological no-no in Islam, or taking a tree or a cow and worship it, or to, you know, taking a fire and worshiping. I'm referring direct uh, uh, indications towards world religions. Islam okay. goes beyond that. It transcends all those limited objects which I worship, and that's where people's confusion come in, that why am I limiting my devotion, my gratitude, okay. and this metaphysical uh, inner inertia of human beings to be devoted? Just like, you know, for okay, example, Abdul, like you are devoted. No, Abdul, I'm going to stop you for a sec. Just because... a minute. Uh, okay, I will be very, very quick because you, you've been going on for a little while and we do need to take more calls. And we're so far away from the premise of your original argument right now because it feels as though every time we've given a pushback, you've just kind of like kicked the goalpost back a little bit so that we could have a discussion about something else. We went all the way from the universe uh, starting to exist and a generic creator, uh, right, like right down to now you're asserting that this is what people's problems is, problem is. You did it to me previously, and you just did it in your your brief conversation that we, or your brief little monologue there. You said, this is the reason people X, right? People believe this because X. This is the problem people have. So you're, you're ascribing problems to other people and then fighting that straw man and instead of having a conversation with us, right? So, like, I asked you a couple of different questions, and I still don't have, like, a good answer to them. But then you're telling me that I'm interrupting you and I'm trying to make sure that you're being listened to. But what I'm actually trying to do is get to the gist of what the original argument is instead of like going down uh, all of these other paths. To, so that now we're having a conversation that isn't even the conversation we intended to have. Okay. So if you go back real quick to the original premise that yeah. the universe, why can we accept a creator? And okay. um, you question about these beings, Malaika and Jinn. And I said, like, right. uh, uh, our, you know, uh, God's knowledge, in God's knowledge, pre-exist. And they are not physical beings, they're metaphysical beings, and they right. are outside our time boundary. So my original premise still stands that the universe, which came from the singularity, and it took 13 billion years, you know, Islam is in sync with that. Islam never gives a false okay. uh, time period to this universe, unlike the, the Christian. Was that the only issue that I had with your premise, though? Years, whatever it is. That wasn't the only issue I had with your premise, well, though. The, you that haven't that demonstrated that there was nothing. You haven't demonstrated that there was nothing prior. You haven't demonstrated that it isn't cyclical. You haven't demonstrated why God was motivated to create. 
like all, all of these are still problems for me and you telling me the reason that they're problems for me and then asserting something about me that isn't even the case is not going to solve that for me. So let's, we do, we do have to move on. We've had, we've had this call for a really long time. I, I appreciate the conversation. I, I hope you do all feel right. heard. Thank you. So, all right. Thank you. <laughs> have a good rest of your day. You guys took Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> we appreciate you too. <laughs> we do. Not our it, evidently. <laughs> it, it's always like the, the the drop call button has like a three second delay when we hit it when it happens. So I always try to time it so it like is as efficient as possible. And sometimes <laughs> sometimes you miss. Okay. I'm sorry to Abdullah and to the viewers. That's all right. That's I, all I right. messed up. <laughs> I forgive you. All right. Well, now maybe this will make it into what we're about to see next week, which is the clips this is my favorite part i've been in this a couple of times and yeah, it's good usually it's usually i'm usually in the best light possible when I have these. we have several shows other than the atheist experience we have nonprofits <laughs> and secular sexuality and truth wanted and talk heathen and if you haven't watched all of the shows this week here's a little treat for you you might want to go back and watch let's see what they were up to <laughs> Be the porn you want to see in the world uh, might yeah. be my new favorite catchphrase. I'm going to see if I can't get that done up on a t-shirt or, or whatever else. Biblically, uh, you have met ontologically presupposed the divinity of our biblical Christological God within your start and premise. Biblically, biblically, I'm going to drop this call because biblically, I'm getting tired of this conversation yeah. just because i have a penis or something doesn't mean that you could prescribe that i ought to not have long hair or uh i shouldn't paint my you know nails category you're a fertile field that we would love to plow alex johnny wants to plow you yeah. um but he might need to plow you <laughs> further in in a different show i don't know what you missed in science class but if you think that vaccines just don't work, then you are no longer in touch with reality. I wonder if he believes in what the experts say about gravity, or is he jumping off buildings? I don't know. Go check them out, you guys. I think clearly that was the call from Johnny. He wants to break into the adult entertainment scene. And look, Johnny, if you need some pointers, I'll help you out. Okay, look, I know you've been begging to get into the scene. <laughs> Arden, hit up Arden, hit up Arden. Let her know what's up. Oh my gosh. I'm Every oh, time Johnny. I host the show now, I'm like, Oh gosh, what am I gonna say? What stupid thing am I gonna say? <laughs> it's gonna it's the best part about live shows. There's so much to choose from. I know, right? All right, are you ready to take another call? Let's take. Yeah, more. let's dive into it. We've got a couple of good ones here. Uh -oh. mm, how about we I take, like this going uh, blind. Uh, how about Louis in California? Pronouns are he, him. Louis, what's up? Hopefully, it's Louis and not Louis. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it's actually Louis. Luis, Luis, I apologize. Thank you for the correction. So what's your topic? It's okay, everyone. Hello, Shannon, and hello, uh, Arden. Is that how you pronounce your name? Yep. Hello. Uh, um, just real quick, did you know your, did you know your name uh, literally says Burning Heart? Says uh, Arden Heart? Uh, yeah, did you? It, it literally says Burning Heart. Did you know that? I did not know Arden meant burning. I believe the name th oh, at good. least my understanding of its origination was uh, in reference to the forest but <clears throat> well it's because uh, the word arden is it's like short for ardiente which means burning and oh. your last name basically says heart so that's how i see burning heart oh well i love that interpretation thank <laughs> you so much <laughs> anyway what, what is your topic um yeah at the beginning of the call i was asked if i was a theist or an atheist um, mm -hmm. I guess I'm an atheist, but except for the fact that I still believe in the um, that the stories in the Bible are were actually true events that happened. All of them? And, and um, I, maybe not all of them, but the, maybe like the major events. And I'll give an example like, about okay. uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. But okay. first, let me ask you, you, you know what an asteroid is, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Now, you yep. know what happens when it enters uh, Earth's atmosphere, right? It could either just come down as one solid rock or it could break down into many fragments, right? Sure. With you so far. 
and they're basically in just, going. And they're basically <laughs> fireballs, right? I, I don't know that they're basically fireballs. I can see how someone movement. who doesn't have all the information might think that, if that's what you're trying to say. Could be yeah, well, yeah, something way. like that. Okay. Okay, so now, you... if, if if one of those rocks was to hit you, you would you automatically die, right? You will burn up and die, right? Depending Presumably. on the size and velocity, yeah, I guess so. So, are, are you getting that Sodom and Gomorrah is like a town that got hit by an asteroid or something? Exactly. <laughs> Why though? What like what makes you think that that's something that legitimately <laughs> happened? Like based on what? Aside from the understanding that asteroids sometimes hit stuff, and that it's plausible that maybe well, I it think hit it's a town. well, I think it's just an exaggerated. I think it's just an exaggerated version of what really happened. That's what mm -hmm. I mean. But like, why though? Why do you think that there was really a town called Sodom that got? So what I'm hearing, if I'm understanding correctly, is oh you yeah, think I don't know about, there was I don't a town called town. Sodom. I'm just talking about the event. So you think a town got hit by an asteroid, and then made up a story, a mythology around that, and put it in the Bible? Is that what you're saying? It's, yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. I, but why? So, like, but here's the thing. Like, even if that's true, right? Even if the the story originated because someone saw some horrific natural disaster like that and wrote the story, that doesn't mean that the events are true, right? Because the events of Sodom and Gomorrah make, like, claims about God striking down people for a particular reason. I think, think that's the more important thing. If you're just saying natural disasters happen sometimes and people in, uh, you know, like, prehistoric times may have mythologized it somehow sure i can get on board with that but i don't know if it's the case with this story first yeah. of all and I, I don't know what like utility that serves because then i feel like that can almost provide like cover and legitimacy in some people's minds for the uh uh the bigger claims around those stories about like why god did that don't you think that's an issue well i don't believe in god i mean I, i'm Okay, but she's not asking if you believe in God. She's saying that if you're saying that it's a mythologization, I, I probably just made up that word. That's probably not even a word. <laughs> mythologization. You heard it here, folks. Coined by Shannon. If that's a, the people having some sort of natural disaster and then creating a mythology around it um, is something that it, it truly happened. And I don't, I still don't see how you get there. That, um, can and you're saying that the Bible story is based on something that truly happened, then you're giving that foundation. Yes. To, but, to, over, but it's just told in an over-exaggerated form. But you, I, I don't understand why you are asserting that that's true, though, other than you have this intuition, potentially, that natural disasters happen and people tend to embellish stories, which I'll grant both of those. But I don't. I can't get from there to thus. This story in the Bible is based on a specific event, because there's no support for that for me. Is that fair? Yes, I understand. Okay, cool. Maybe like it's I, like thought experiment. It's neat, but like I, I mean, I kind of if if that's all you had, then I guess we'll probably move on because it doesn't seem like we're. Like you're you're actually wanting to like defend that this like is a legitimate thing that happened and that the the broader like like God concepts well, around I mean, it I happened. Can't prove, so. I can't prove that it I can't prove that it happened, but I can it can be demonstrated. I don't know who will be willing to go through that experiment. It can be demonstrated well, how that <laughs> you can if you can't you can't he, prove he, that he, it happened. If he was to get hit, look, if you was to get hit by a fragment from an asteroid, you will basically just die or you will burn up, right? You will probably just like turn literally back. nobody's arguing that asteroids can't aren't capable of causing mass destruction. Yeah. Like we're on we're on your team there. <laughs> asteroids can kill the crap okay, out of so people. If, if I was yes. just, if I was to exaggerate that story, I would say, you know, Lot's wife turned back and turned into a pillar of salt upon the side okay, of so God. That's who was a bridge too far. You know, Rain destruction upon Sodom and Gomorrah. So you're okay. Okay. So well, you're saying I mean, that you're sorry. It, it happened, and if it happened, and you were to write the story, it would go without saying that you would say, and then this lady turned into salt. 
Like <laughs> that would be the exaggerated. That would be the exaggerated story. That's like the natural yeah. progression of something. Okay, go ahead. Like yeah, this this, this I, I I hear what you mean, and I'm sure there's some truth to that. I'm sure there are plenty of stories throughout history that have been inspired by natural disaster, but that doesn't really bring us any understanding. It doesn't demonstrate that it's true or that it's even plausible that it's true. It's just like speculating. Like there's. We can think of a million reasons that a bunch of fictional stories throughout history could have been inspired by, but like, what what does that do for us? That doesn't show that they're true. It definitely doesn't give us a reason to think, to believe in them, right? And you're not even arguing for that. So I don't really understand what the what the point of this is. Right. I don't know. I just wanted to give my opinion on what, what I think the Bible is really talking about. Okay. All right. Well, cool. thanks for giving us your opinion. Uh, and we'll uh, talk to you later. Awesome. See you later. Okay, thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye, Luis. All right. That okay. All right. I'm just I'm trying to wrap my head around how you get from an asteroid destroying things to also she naturally it would follow that she turned into salt. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Yeah. <laughs> The the I mean, thought obviously. experiment thing is is just I I I never follow that. Like it's it's interesting. You can sit there and do that all day for literally everything yeah. it just i don't it doesn't help at I all i don't even for think it's impossible it's not even necessarily implausible like maybe there was a natural disaster that got you know mythologized did or whatever i called it um but like you can't really support it. anyway let's take another call yep well, I'm yep just let's keep myself on now. cruising uh coming up next we've got ramsey he him from egypt ramsey hey. you are live what's going on hello hey hello hello Hi. Hello, how are you, Arvin and Shannon? Hello, Ramsey, well. how are you? What's up? I'm doing well. Uh, yeah, so uh, I have a question about the cosmological argument. Oh. Um, so I listened cool. to the previous call, Abdullah. Mm -hmm. So I will try not to repeat myself. Uh, so I, I guess, Shannon, you have a, an issue with, uh, like, the universe has a beginning, right? Yeah, well, I don't know that it's that I have an issue. I feel as though that premise isn't fully supported, so like demonstrably so, right? I think that um, people so assert like it the... based on you know what what we have as scientific knowledge now and philosophy that they they make an assertion that isn't necessarily even founded on deeply rooted scientific knowledge when it comes to cosmology. They just say you know, they have this understanding that there was a thing, there was an initial event of some sort, and then cast a bunch of assertions onto that in order to say, A, it couldn't be cyclical, B, there was nothing, like a true nothing before, and then, yeah. So, yeah, I guess that that is the premise that I have an issue with, one of them, yeah. So, like, I believe that heat death, it's like most physicists say it's most likely what will happen. In the psychedelic universe, like, all the evidence goes to that there is a, an end to this universe, an end to the available energy. Okay, I'm not an so astrophysicist, like, so I don't know. Maybe? Like, that's what we, like, uh, yeah, what, what most of them say that, that the heat okay. death, it's, the universe will end. Okay. And basically, like, the second law of thermodynamics says, like, the universe is decaying. Like, there is available energy in the beginning, and then it's decaying, decaying, decaying. And Isn't it ends, like, in a closed the beginning system? and the end. Okay. Sure. sure. So, so, how does the this... The universe, it's a closed system. Mm -hmm. So, I don't... I'm still... I'm not understanding how this supports that premise, though. Are we getting there? So basically, like, the, uh, it proves that the physical universe Need the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, why? So this is why, I like, the, uh, why does it? How does it prove that? Uh, because some, uh, because like the available energy, it, like the universe, it's always uh, the energy. It's in in disorder all the time. So the, the beginning, the available energy, where it comes from. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. So I'm, I'm still I'm not getting how therefore. Um, the universe began to exist and there was like truly nothing before it and it didn't it there's it, it's impossible for it to be cyclical because it could be that energy is just something that always existed right 
Because energy, we, like, we know we can't destroy uh, energy. Nor create it. It could be if we don't know that the energy is always, like, in the case of this order, like, always going to be unavailable. It's going to end. Energy. So that's why, like, there is a need for... An, why does the, the disorder that affect that, though? Mm -hmm. Why does the, the order or lack thereof the energy affect the state of the universe before this instantiation of the universe? Yeah. Far more succinct than me. Thank you. So, like, <laughs> no, so why, uh, I'm sorry, what's the question again? I'm so sorry. Can you repeat? I, I'm just, you're, you're, so if I'm, I'm following, maybe I'm not following correctly. That's totally possible. I'll try to articulate mm -hmm. my, my thinking. It, it sounded like Shannon was asking, how, she needed help with demonstrating that there was nothing before this instantiation of the universe. And you said, well, we know that because energy is always in disorder. I'm not seeing the link between those two things. How does the energy being in disorder lead to nothing before the universe as we understand it? Yeah. Does that... Uh, okay. Uh... Or did I miss the mark? Yeah, in a sense, like, my Nailed it for me. Is like if, <laughs> or my thing is like if things they are naturally dissipating, like you know, like at the point of the Big Bang, there's like a singularity, like where it, like how naturally it doesn't happen, like make sense? No, I don't think so. That's, That's why, I like, this is like the physical universe, slow. how it's no. working. But are you not? So, are you trying to say that because energy is dissipating or is in mm -hmm. a state of disorder therefore it originated at a single point because i don't even think that i'm arguing against that because i agree that the rapid expansion took place so i i just i don't understand how that even addresses my objection which is that people are just making an assertion that there was truly nothing beforehand and no one can demonstrate that the universe isn't cyclical. So the premise itself is unsupported unless you're making an assertion. So I mean like the heat death proves that the universe is not cyclical. The heat can we agree death on that? proves that the universe isn't... Uh, no, I don't think that I can. So you're saying that if the universe, this okay, I think I'm seeing where you're getting, that it started at a finite point, and then there will be some sort of heat death, and that means that there is mm -hmm. also a, a, a finite point at the end that we can point to, and we can say, and this is when it's over. So, I, so how do you exactly like that get from the universe? Like right. So what does that look like to you that you could that you're comfortable in making the assertion that at that point things things couldn't start over again? So like, it, um, what so about it, that makes you comfortable making that statement? So like, uh, as I mentioned, like more, the heat death, like energy won't be avail uh, um, available to do something what again, if, like the Big Bang. What happens to the energy? What happens to the energy? It will be unavailable, like can be, ah. do, can do any work, like it's heat death, no work at all. Well, it's here, like if I can form of universe, just pipe in, like... Ramsey, I, like, look, I, I don't think either Shannon or I are, are cosmologists. We're not specialized in this in any way, shape, or form. So you may be right that that is true for the end of the universe, but I'm failing to see, and I think this is Shannon's point, mm -hmm. how this relates back to that first premise of there being nothing beforehand. It may be that at the end, it will be unusable and just, I don't know, floating around doing nothing there. But how does that relate to there being nothing beforehand? I feel like you haven't demonstrated that. And it, it could be our lack of understanding, mm -hmm. but I, I don't feel like it is. Um, so like if the natural laws doesn't make the energy available in this form, that this concentrated form, singularity, so there is a need for unphysical creator in a sense. Like this is, these are the rules of the physical universe. I, I can't get it's there with you. And I'm, something like the Big Bang happened. So, and here's a problem with conversations like this, is that none of us are astrophysicists. I don't know, maybe you're an astrophysicist. Ramsey, perhaps you are. No, I'm not. Yeah, so no. we have three lay people 
<laughs> relaying our yeah. lay understanding of astrophysics to one another right now where like a any one of us could be so far off base that it's comically ridiculous to an <laughs> astrophysics professor that's watching this right now I'm so sure it is. This conversation to me is just which one of our remedial understandings of astrophysics is going to win in this conversation. <laughs> and People. I don't know what the point of that that is. And it's like it still doesn't answer my objection because you're you're just you're making you you have a maybe more than remedial understanding. I, I don't know you personally, but any of these assertions you're making could be so unsupported by the actual science and astrophysics that that it's ridiculous. And I would have no idea. I just wouldn't know because I, I've, I'm not an expert in the field. So mm. I, I, it's just, you know, it's like putting two Furbies in one in front of one another and expecting them to like write Shakespeare. That's what, that's what yeah. this feels like to me right now. <laughs> I, yeah. I think Ramsey, I, I appreciate you calling in and, and shooting your shot. I think it, you did well. Uh, Better than most. As, far, as far as I can tell, like n none of us here really, are, are demonstrating we're not like solving the issues we have with the cosmological argument and we're not i don't think any of us are probably wrapping our heads around these concepts accurately so maybe it's best if we pause this conversation for today and, and maybe yeah. we all should read a little bit before we come back and try that kind of conversation again i enjoy talking to you though um, it's interesting okay. it'll give me something to think about for sure yeah yeah um, all right okay sure um, Thanks, thank you so much for stuff. Okay. No problem. Thank you for staying on the topic too. Oh my God. I love you for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. I mean, we tried, but yeah, it was just, it's, it's the, like that point of like the, the assertion and like, yeah, asking just... for the link and not getting the link. And it's like, it, it may well be there, but I'm not getting it. Um, yeah. And uh, I get to the we, point where I'm like, I have no good reason to accept, except for you're making an assertion, and it's no better than my best judgment, potentially, which yeah. it would just be me making an assertion at this point. So it's not benefiting anybody. Yeah. Right. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, all right. We've got some more callers on the line. Let's How about up. we bring in uh, Mike, he, him, and Maine? Mike, Mike, Mike. Mike. Welcome. What's going on? What's Hello. your topic? Hi. Uh, so it's addressing the main argument i've heard against uh, abortion from many different oh. atheists including yourself tonight okay. um right. and it's a, it's the argument of you don't have a right to anyone else's body um sure and so my my main argument against that is um as soon as a child is born the yeah. parents or guardians are obligated to take care of it and if they don't they go to jail so legally, your position is just not true. Um, that's what I'm saying. It, you know, you require the body to take care of something. So <laughs> semantics. That's my argument. <laughs> so your argument is yeah. semantics, because you actually aren't legally like if if you agree to take on care of the child, then you are obligated to. But you do not have to agree to take on care of the child. You can put that child up for adoption, for example, right? So you are no oh, yeah. longer but required. So this is a this is about a contractual understanding essentially from a legal perspective it's not about bodily autonomy cool. it's about an agreement no i'm not let, let me address please before before we go on so you're saying so once a child is born if the mother and father or whomever decides to keep it then they have an obligation because they have chosen to take on that obligation they have saying okay i understand that i have this child and i am going to keep this child and that means that i take on the onus of responsibility to care for this child but that is not an obligation because they could say you know what i don't think that i'm capable of doing this and they could say here you go state you have the child i can't take on this obligation which actually negates your argument because you're just saying that you're you're saying for your argument to hold true that person would have to as a mandate take on the obligation of caring for that child and they don't just once yeah, they contractually yeah, agree no, to it, then they need to fulfill the obligations of, of that social contract. That's it. No, I disagree because, and this why? is why, because the obligation doesn't go away. It just gets passed from the parents to whoever becomes the new guardians. So they're That's still, right. and whoever, whoever takes on that contract, care of them, they have the obligation. Yeah, if, they, right. if they neglect, they right. will. So legally, if they neglect it, then right. they'll be punished. And they're, they, you know, the child has a right to be taken care of until it's 18, according to the law, because by they agree to that obligation. Guardian. 
So because they agreed to that obligation, yeah. right? They agreed to it, right? Yes, yes. They but agreed to the obligation. But, but Do you, are, are, can you force someone to agree to that obligation? Um, you know, I don't know if someone can get rejected from putting the kid so up to. Yeah, you can't. You can't force someone to take on that obligation, right? So. Well, well, let's say do. nobody volunteers to say, you know, we'll take your kid into foster care or adopt you, then they are still no, responsible. It, it's not like, it's not so one. So in a hypothetical world paper thing. where there's no one else huh? able to take care of your child. So you're saying in a hypothetical world where there's nobody else capable to take care of the child, where these systems don't exist, you have an obligation I'm to take saying, care of the child? I'm saying that whoever ends up taking care of it, they, they are bound to use their bodies to take care of the child, whoever it ends up with. That well, that's not the same. Level. Though. It's not the same. And it, they're not bound to use it their is bodies. The same because no, they're not. Okay. No, Mike, stop. Are. Using your body in the sense of I have to like carry this child and feed them is not the same as I have to be a physical incubator for this organism. Those things are extremely different. I mean, if you want to, I mean, from the from the way I've heard the argument presented, nobody's ever, you know, made that differentiation. If you obviously nobody else can be the incubator, although that's not true with in vitro and stuff. But but the point is that use I've heard the term use your body. So, I mean, maybe if you want to change it to be an incubator then that's a different question, but. It's not what I'm so it's, it's is, all about autonomy though. No, it's about autonomy, which is I think the point that you're not getting. You're saying that there is an obligation. And I'm saying no, there actually isn't an obligation to utilize your body to take care of a child. You can relinquish the rights to that child at any point in time, and it is no longer your obligation. Yeah, but it's not right. yours, but it's someone's. It still exists. That's, no, but it's not that, yours. That doesn't really <laughs> it's nobody's individual no. obligation, right? They're, they're, would run luckily, we live in a society that has I mean, an infrastructure that takes that takes on children from people who have relinquished the, that obligation. But there isn't anybody going up to to parents who have given up their children for adoption and saying to them, "Nah, -uh, you can't do this. You have an obligation. You absolutely have to be. You this, have to be the one to take care of this child. You can relate. You yeah, can say. And in that instance, no, I'm not done speaking yet. Please, one moment, please, Mike. In that instance, you can say, you know what, and, and, and we'll even play into your argument. I don't want to use the resources of my body to take care of this child, even external of me. You can say, I don't want to do that. And then you don't have to. You could, you could maybe say, well, I don't like that. That makes me feel icky because I feel like someone should have to take care of this child. And all of us have that sort of inclination. Well, most of us, I would like to think, have that inclination, which is why these infrastructures exist. But the fact of the matter is that there is no obligation to, for anybody to take care of a child until they agree to that social contract until they say i okay. agree that i will take on this child and i will have the i will have the burden of care that is something that i agree to contractually and then once you have custody of that child then you have an obligation legally to take care of that child and i would argue more morally but not up until that point most people that do that are parents that actually gave birth to the child, but not all. And the parents don't have to. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I think the point that needs to be made is that the infrastructure is still made up of people. It's not some nebulous thing. Yeah. And so, so. the burden is getting passed to someone. If someone will land with that, it's oh. not going to end up in the gutter. Yes. So and the know who's going to land so with I, that burden? Someone who's I, consenting to take on that burden. Ding, ding. Yeah, but the thing is, if they ever, so, so, okay, so what you, what you point out is one option. Yes, you can pass the burden to someone, but you cannot, you can't just say, I acknowledge you have the burden and then just totally forget about it because then you are held responsible. So, I mean, once you're consent to option, taking that on, yes, for sure. Absolutely. Once you consent to that social contract. Yeah. Sure, then you'd be negligent once, because so you agreed you, to do something and then you didn't do it. Yeah, but the point is, even if you're, so basically you're saying, you know, if you, you can basically just kick the king down the road. Um, I guess. No, I'm saying that no one can force me to do anything with my body. That's what I'm saying. No one can force me well, or you or Arden or anybody else to do anything 
with our body. Like nobody can use I mean, I, a part of my body to sustain I, anyone's life. No one can. Zero people can do that. Yeah, that's not. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's not true. And you're saying, yeah, people well, uh, uh, because the, the, if you have a kid, then you have to walk across the room to give it milk. So that you have to use your body to do that. And that's just an argument for, that's just semantics because we exist corporally. So we have bodies. So anything that we agree to do, we're going to do with our bodies once we agree to do it. But you can't use my body to sustain yeah. anybody's life. You can't. You can't force me to use my body to sustain anybody's life. And if you want to extend that to once I have a child, I have to use my body to be able to actually, you know, hand it things and change its diapers, then I'm still saying, no, actually, don't. When I had my son, if I did, didn't feel like that was something I could do, I would have given him up for adoption. You don't. You still don't have the right to use my body in that circumstance. Okay. But you're saying, yeah, well, somebody else will have to. Yeah, because they consented to do it. Okay, we well, may not up like until it, the point, up until the point, true. even if you decide you don't want to, up until the point that child gets adopted, you're responsible. Even though you don't want to be responsible, you are responsible. So no, you're not. Uh, you give the no, child to the state immediately be, at birth. If, if you're abdicating responsibility, I imagine most developed countries would have a system where that child would become the responsibility of the state. Right. But the state is made of people. I mean, it's not just a yes. random... Yes, and they have systems where they have consented to have an open basket. So when parents say, I can't handle this responsibility, there is a place for those children to go. Right. Okay, I guess if you kick... I mean, something else you said about I can't... You don't have to like it, but it's sure still that... true. <laughs> it's still true. No, I'm, I'm a... I'm addressing something else you said about you can't force some. I'm pretty sure that people can be, people are forced from harming themselves in certain situations. So I don't think that's true. That if you want forced to. Forced from harming themselves. You are know, you saying that people can't you said you can't. You, you, I'm, obviously, they can. I'm saying people, their autonomy is taken away. They get put in an institution, whatever. So that is another instance. I mean, I know that's not the initial topic, but that is another instance. Let's kind of put this separate you issue. We're just talking about there, bodily autonomy now, and that there's instances where people, in order to protect society from them or protect them from themselves, may be restrained. <laughs> is if, if that's what you're talking yeah. about, then so you're saying that that yeah, is that's evidence autonomy. that bodily autonomy is conditional. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. That's evidence that bodily autonomy is conditional because people can prevent you from harming yourself. Well, that we yeah, could have we, a debate about we, whether or yeah. not that is a moral imperative, though. Like, should somebody have the autonomy to be able to take their own life? Sh yeah, should they choose? That's a, that's a different debate, and I don't know where right. I would land on that because yeah, I think maybe I they should. Yeah, well, I agree. It's different. Um, I'm just obviously talking about legally that because you know you can also yeah. say that you think even if the parent does have the kid, they should be able to just leave it. Leave it in a gutter. So I mean, that is literally not what know, I said. Once you agree to that contract, no, no, you have consented to I'm having that obligation, that. and you haven't. You would now have that obligation. You have taken that obligation on. So if you take a kid and launch not, it from a cannon at that point, you are you. You can't do that. If you leave it out on the side of the road, you can't do that because that's not you fulfilling the obligation. But what I am saying is that you can opt out of that obligation. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't saying you're saying that. I'm just saying that that is, you know, we kind of started from that premise because I was approaching it legally initially, not because obviously someone could say, well, who cares? I mean, it doesn't matter. So well, I think it's just semantics anyway, because just, it's a completely different type of argument. I'm saying you can't use my body to sustain life, like actually use my body to sustain somebody else's life. You can't take a totally, component of you're me. You're definitely just... I'm, okay. You can't take a component of my body and utilize my organs. Let's say, let's just, let's 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 bring it down just to organs. Even you can't use my body's resource and my organs to sustain somebody else's life. If you need a kidney, you can't make me give it to you. If you need blood, you can't make me give it to you. If you need a piece of my liver, you can't make me give it to you. If you need my uterus, you can't make me give it to you. Right. So you would agree, I yeah, think, but... in all of those circumstances, like you would agree with blood, you would agree with liver, you would agree with kidney, and then you stop at uterus and say, uh-uh, you do have to do that. And the reason that you should have to do that is because body autonomy is kind of this fluid way of looking at it anyway, because in other circumstances, you may have to use your body or not be allowed to use your body in certain ways. Therefore, your entire argument is mute, except for I agree with that, and only this one is the one that I would refute.
So yeah, unless you're saying well, I should I, be obligated to give a piece of my liver or I should be obligated to donate a kidney and I should always be obligated to give blood, then in which case it well, seems to me that you're just, just special it, pleading just in order to argue with this one. Just the uterus is a special exception it. for you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, I mean, your, your organs make up the whole, your organs make up the whole you. So your organs are definitely contributing to sustaining life even after the child is born. So, I mean, just so bring you're back. You're not actually way. answering I mean, the question. I'm saying, should I be obligated to give a piece of my liver to somebody if they need it? No. And when you have a child, you don't. Really Why, should do I be obligated to give my uterus to somebody if they need it? No. And you don't give you're, the uterus to the child. So your analogy. Yes, you do. <laughs> you, yes, no, you do, actually. It's there, but you no, it's there. It's there? Okay. Oh, okay. my God. Mike, come How on. How do you have a child He's, without your uterus? That's so, that's so <laughs> fucking dishonest, dude. Just stop. Like, either... No, it's uh, not. Okay. You're, you're talking about, you're talking about, like, taking... An the uterus is the just one. there. It's Mike, just... Mike, I'll give you a swing. <laughs> swing. Why do you think that we think it's different? That Can you articulate different. why we think oh, it's the, different? The organ... No, so why it's different it's when an it's when a fetus yeah. is in a womb and using that womb requires that womb to stay alive. Why that's different than the the bodily autonomy that's sacrificed in the terms of like I carry my my newborn child around. Why why are those two things different? Can you imagine? Because sure, you could articulate this in a way where the womb is just there. The fetus didn't mean to. Sh the, the fetus just showed up and the womb no. was there. It's not its fault that it relies on that. But I, I think you know why we think that's different because that impacts the woman's body, right? That's going to change her body forever. That's going; she's going to have to go through a likely painful process to bring that child out of her womb into the physical world. Like all these things are something that I mean, this person is going I mean, to have to sacrifice consensually to bring this child no. into the world. That's different. Yeah, I think you know that. I think you're just being totally, dishonest. I, I'm saying it's different, but it's also totally subjective as to whether, you know, someone would rather endure the childbirth process or go through 18 years of taking care of like something and bearing that burden. So, I mean, that's just, I mean, it, whether or not it's different doesn't prove the argument wrong or right. Obviously it's different. I I'm just saying that. Answer, like you still haven't answered my that? original question. Sh should I be obligated to donate blood? No, I already said no. You shouldn't be okay. obligated to give so up your liver. You said now that you're you're creating a special set of circumstances for my uterus then, because and the, to say it's just well, it's there as though I'm, it's I'm not, not being creating. used. You are though. Okay, so I'm, why should why should I when, have to allow a, a fetus to use my uterus? Why? Why is that different? Why should you have to? I the difference I was saying is that with giving blood or giving a piece of your liver or a kidney, mm -hmm. you lose that. You don't lose your uterus when the baby's there. It's still there when the baby's gone. So that's not you an don't. analogous situation. It is an analogous situation, especially the giving blood one, for example, right? So when I, when I give blood, that is far less invasive and has far fewer impacts on my body overall in the long term than a pregnancy. I mean, this is like, tell me you've never had a pregnancy without telling me you've never had a pregnancy. <laughs> I had to be induced, for example, yeah, because I'm, I have multiple sclerosis. A... Uh, like I have, I have multiple sclerosis. So I had to be induced when I was pregnant because I started losing the function of my legs because the pregnancy itself was ex exceptionally detrimental to my body. And I also had a, a mild form of dysplasia which meant that my uterus wasn't lined up appropriately, which caused me to now have relatively constant pain during menstruation that I didn't have prior because of this pregnancy. So I have lifelong effects as a result of me having this pregnancy, which I wholeheartedly consented to and would do 10 out of 10 would do again because I love my son. So that's not the point of this argument. But the thing is, me giving blood is, has far less potential detrimental effects. Women can die during childbirth. So for you to drill it down to saying, well, you never get that kidney back, there's a million things about my body that, oh my God, I will never get back because of that pregnancy. So you are wrong. Well, I, I wasn't arguing that pregnancy has no effects. I mean, well, I mean, I still I get to keep to my you, my uterus, right? So it's basically the same as giving blood, although the, it's not because I can That's be forced what... to go through that, but I can't be forced to give blood. I like I am just so over the semantic arguments about women's bodies. 
All of us are forced to sit here constantly listening to people giving semantic, rid ridiculous and trivial arguments about how we should be forced to do something with our bodies. And when I am done with, like, I am done. I am done. You cannot force me to give blood. You cannot force me to give my uterus. That is the end, period, full stop. The end. There, if there, there are dramatic differences. And for you to drill down my body and going through a pregnancy to being the same as giving blood because I get to keep my uterus? Like, that, that's insulting to me. I've given birth. I've been pregnant more than once and I've lost a child that I wanted. So don't tell me what it's like to be pregnant. Yep, yeah, I, I think that this conversation has ceased being productive. Uh, it, I think we probably can end this call here. But thanks so much for calling, Mike. Well, actually, no, I, I don't thank you for calling, but you did it. So that's a thing. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate him calling. I just like I get, I, I get it, and I try, and I try. Yeah. And, and, you, and I try, and I try, but it's just it's very difficult because you get to the point that you're essentially saying you're telling me you're like looking me in the eyes and telling me that you get to tell me what to do with myself. Yeah. And. I, I'm supposed to sit here and like, just think about all of the, the intellectual reasons why you might be right, why I should actually have to do with my body what you tell me to do. Like that's that's what the outcome of that conversation is when somebody has it with somebody like me. That's, that's the desired outcome for me to go, yeah, you know what? You're right. You have the right to tell me what to do with my body, not me. Yeah, you're right. I see your point. No, go fuck yourself. Anyway. Yeah. So, if you'd like to talk to us on Discord, we'll be there after. <laughs> we'll be yeah, there after. Oh wrap up the show. We were a little over time anyway. It, it was good. It was a good time to drop mic. Also, I apologize in chat, but I want to say it live too. I I was using very very gendered language there, and I, I want to be clear that obviously, not everyone who gives birth is a woman. But of course, I, I think it's habitual language. It's ingrained. Working on it. That's a good call it from the chat. I love that uh, our audience takes note of those things because that's a worthy correction. Yeah. I will try to be more cognizant of that myself in the future. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, Arden, tell everybody where they can find you. <laughs> well, I don't want to get the ACA in trouble, so I won't give you links, but I'll tell you what. Follow me on Twitter, okay? There's You'll, you'll get plenty of opportunities to know where to go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I'll be back. Oh my gosh. And uh we need to we need to acknowledge our crew again just because they, they have to deal with Hell all yes. of our ridiculous <laughs> foolishness. My computer exploded today, and then our <laughs> and then our college studio went down, and they seamlessly and effortlessly managed to deal with it all with grace and dignity. And we can't appreciate them and all of our volunteers enough. And we will be on the Discord afterward. Go check out the Discord. I will. I will be there. I will. I will go do some minor meditation, <laughs> get myself together, and we will see you guys over there. And as always, everyone, help elevate the discourse. Bye. What will it take for you to start? It's time to get sexy, so watch Secular Sexuality Live Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash YTSS and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash callsex.